Amen. You may be seated, and we're glad to have, have you here this morning, and I'll turn it over to Brother Gip, and pray for him as he uh, preaches and teaches for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pass the chicken. Okay, he's coming through. So I'm helping out. It's fine. Got the volume going. Usually, usually what I do is I'll put it right here, and I'll say, "Is that okay?" And I go a little higher, and I go, "Is that okay?" <clears throat> anyway, well, amen. Well, good to be saved. Isn't it good to be in church on a morning? Amen. My favorite time. Well, I think about this. Um, did you ever notice how much trouble you can get into being where you don't belong? I knew a guy that got arrested just for, he went to the home, the, the, like, the, like the builder supply, and he loaded the back of his pickup truck with uh, shingles at two in the morning. <laughs> he was there when he wasn't supposed to be there. And uh, people think of church, uh, I don't know if you ever, you do your GPS on your phone, you know, it's a smartphone. In fact, let me make sure this one's on. Um, I was in Australia a while back, and my smartphone said, you're 17 minutes from home. <laughs> smartphone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll be heading for a meeting, in, uh, like on a Monday, like now. If you put in directions, it'll go, now, now the church, uh, Victory Baptist Church may not be open right now. Well, we don't have to listen to the smartphone. It doesn't know nothing, okay? But I like, I like being in church, but I like being in church when you're not supposed to be there. Because some, of, some folks, you know why they go to church on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night? Because they know they better. They know somebody's going to knock on their door if they don't. Nobody makes you come on a Tuesday morning except the Lord. Okay, so it's just good to be in church. Uh, open your Bibles to um, Romans chapter 9. I'm, I'm not going to preach out of that. I just want to see if it's in your version. And what we're going to talk about, again, it, it, now... Uh, Last night, today, tonight, <clears throat> uh, just going to be a lot of scripture because there's nothing. I'll try to show you something at the end. There is, n I, don't, I don't know if there's anything in scripture that is stated <clears throat> more than the restoration of Israel. All right? There's some important doctrines in the Bible, and we'll, when we get to the end of this, we'll look at some of those. And the reason, I, uh, the reason I reproduced all these verses is so that you would have them. This is, uh, this is just, uh, uh, you know, I call people, like some of the books, some of the books on a table, uh, I don't call them books, I call them bullets, like the answer book, or there's one we, that, where you deal with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, and, that, and, uh, and, and we got one that you deal with Mormons, and someday we'll have one where you deal with Andersonites. But um, uh, I call those bullets because you guys know what to do with the bullet. You put it in your weapon and you do one of two things. You defend yourself or go hunting. And so um, this, is, uh, this is just going to be all scripture and we'll look at it and I'll give you something to think about because some of you probably didn't bring your remote. Just hold your remote in your hand, you actually might have an idea because Americans don't, don't use their brains anymore, they use their remotes. And here's what Paul said. <clears throat> I said truth in Christ, I lie not. Now, first off, he didn't have to tell us he's not going to lie to us. But when, have you ever said that to somebody who knew you weren't going to lie to him? You know why you said I lie not? Because you are emphasizing that what I'm about to tell you is rock solid. It's like saying something like, oh, let's say you can keep your own doctor, period. Oh, well, no, not, not exactly like that. Anyway, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience, also bearing, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and can, continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish myself, uh, wish that myself were accursed from Christ uh, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And the first section here is called what uh, the Apostle Paul's, Apostle Paul's statements concerning Israel. You know, Paul is where we go for our doctrine. Uh, we learn so much. I guess you could if you, you made a conscious attempt, but if you show somebody something about grace, you're going to end up in one of Paul's books. Uh, if you're going to show them about salvation by, by grace and, and, and putting your faith in Christ, 
you're going to end up in one of Paul's books. Isn't that true? If you're going to show somebody about local church polity and, and, and policy, you're going to Paul. Isn't that true? I'm not negating the rest of the Bible, but I'm telling you, this is the guy that tells us this stuff and, uh, and, and really led the church he said to follow him. And the first thing he says is that he has a heaviness in his heart. And I mentioned this Sunday. Uh, so if you weren't here, I want to say it now. Here's the thing I, I do not understand. Uh, you know, there's some things that if, if this comes, this comes. Uh, I had a missionary friend. He was in a church, uh, well, it's been a number of years ago. And the pastor was a good man. Uh, and the pastor said, I'm taking Baptist off the name of the church. And this missionary said, why? And, and they take it off for two reasons. They claim. One, they say, we'll get more visitors. Or two, they say, we're tired of fighting over the name Baptist. And um, this particular guy said, well, I'm tired of fighting over the name Baptist. And so the missionary said, and they were good. They were, he wasn't just his pastor. They were good friends. He said, okay. he said uh, I'll, I'll be leaving the church. He said, why? He said, we're, we're still going to teach everything we teach now. We're still going to baptize them after they get saved. We're not changing anything we teach. He said, no. He said, I'm leaving because he said, uh, sounds like the pizza's ready. Anyway, um, he said, because you think you made this, this one isolated decision. But he said, I think you're on the beginning of a path that we don't know where it's going to lead to. Um, and the guy said, oh, no, 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 oh, no, no, no. He got tired of fighting over the name Baptist. Then he got tired of fighting over music standards. Then he got tired of fighting over any Christian standards living. Uh, he, guess what? He got tired of fighting over the King James Bible. That church today is a contemporary church. That pastor, thankfully, is out of the ministry where he belongs. But what I'm saying is that, you know, if, you, if the guy starts here, you already know where he's going to end up. Isn't that true? And so here's what I don't understand about this replacement theology. Not just they, that they believe it because it's not anywhere found in the Bible, but if they, if they believe in replacement of theology, uh, uh, theology, part and part, whenever they believe in, um, in replacement theology, on the back of the page, they don't know it when they buy the front, we must hate Israel. I, I told them Sunday, I've never heard anybody yet that says, you know, they, they teach exactly what replacement theology people teach. Uh, I think that God is done with Israel. I think we're the replacement for Israel. Boy, if he, if, uh, if Steve Anderson takes those statements right there, he's really going to make a good video, isn't he? But he said, they say, uh, I believe we're the replacement for Israel. God's done with Israel. I've never heard anybody say that and then say this. But now we still love the Jews and we, we support missionaries to them. Uh, and, and we hope that they get saved. They always detest Israel. They hate Israel. Uh, this this uh, Anderson, he has got a kindred spirit with Muslims. He hates the Jews. And so here's Paul, and here's what Paul said. He said, verse 3, I for, could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So he's talking about the very people that Anderson says God has nothing to do with anymore. So Anderson hates them. And Paul says, I would be willing to turn in my salvation and go to hell if they would get saved. You couldn't, you know, you don't have to claim that. You don't have to, you know, we always like to hear somebody says something great and then we try to claim it for ourselves. And you don't have to claim uh, you know, say that about, you know, I just wish, you know, that I would go to hell if it was just for uh, the Browns would win a game. Oh, no, um, I just want Cleveland to get a professional football team someday. But he says that, he said, I would go to hell. Now think about this. You've got two men, one the Apostle Paul, Steve Anderson, one says, I would be willing to turn in my salvation and go to hell if Israel would get saved. And the other one says, I hate Israel. They call me all the time. I got them on my phone, uh, 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 voicemails, you know, they call me a Jew bag because I, I, I stand with Israel. And you have to decide. And you people who are watching this uh, that are following them, you got to decide who are you going to follow, the Bible or Steve Anderson? Because the spirit he has is not the same spirit that the Apostle Paul had. 
Um, and and I, I, this, uh, this one guy, McMurtry guy that you talked to, and uh, I talked to him a few years ago, and, and the guys, you know, if you think about this, and this is true, and if you're an Anderson follower, you know this is true. We, Bible believers, whenever we believe something uh, or want to accomplish something, we go here to the Bible, right? Whenever they want to accomplish something, they go to a video. I was talking to the guys last night after service. I said, you know, uh, uh, Arizona is about two times earlier than us, and we're, out here, we're eating after service, and I said, don't you know? A lot of editing and cutting going on in Arizona tonight. <laughs> but every one of those guys, they are experts in doing something with a video. We are, I am not interested. You know, I, the, the 30 generation, uh, I see some of the 30 year olds, even in our churches, they get more excited when they can talk about what, they're, what they found their phone can do, where, where when we were 30s, we talked about something we found in the Bible. Beware of that, okay? Beware of this thing where, oh, look, look what it can do. Oh, look what I can. It, it, yeah, it'll think you're 17 miles from home when you're in, in, in uh, Australia. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm talking to McMurtry, and I, and I, you know, I tried to use as many single syllable words as I could. And then after we talk, and, and, and here's what happens, guys. Now, look, let me tell you something. I'm dying. Say, what do you have? Life. That's when you're light, when you're alive, you're headed for death. Okay, and it's all closer now. And I really, I, I keep that in mind in everything that I do. That I only have a limited amount of time. Uh, according to the Bible, I got two more years. And so, I'm going to talk to anybody. I'll, I'll talk to anybody that's sincere. But at the point that I realize that I would be doing just as good talking to that whiteboard then I'm not wasting my time anymore. You say, don't you have a burden for him? No. Why would, I have, why would I have a burden for a rock? Okay? I mean, if the heart is hard and the head is closed, I, I think I'll just go get a burger. I can accomplish it. And so, uh, so I get done, and I said, um, and, and, and that's when he went to this thing. I told you, I showed the Old Testament um, verses on God restoring Israel, and he says, that's us. I said, so you're telling me that everything God promised Israel in the Old Testament was actually for another dispensation. And, you know, he, he probably doesn't even eat with a fork. I know he doesn't, because I know if he had, I'd see four holes inside of his face when he tried to eat it. Well, then he told somebody later, he goes, well, I thought, I thought Dr. Gipp would spend more time in, in uh, Romans chapter 9. And here's why, because it talks about, you know, Israel, kind of like us being, being the Jews. And I, I point this out. I don't know if you know the Bible, but did anybody notice what comes after Romans chapter 9? Yeah, that's kind of a catchy thing. You say, well, what's that mean? Well, God wrote Romans chapter 9, and like what, what Brother Bill was talking about last night, uh, the verses that they go to to prove their crazy doctrines, they'll all run to Romans 9. And I said, yeah, God inspired Romans chapter 9. I said, when he was done, then he inspired Romans chapter 10 and 11 so that nobody would get stuck in chapter 9. He knew that there's some idiots that, that uh, you know, couldn't find their shoes if they started with both hands and, and started their knees. And, he, and so he wrote 10 and 11 so that nobody would misunderstand 9. Look what he says in 10. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I would like to hear those words come out of Anderson's mouth. Except I did. He'd do it only because he just picked this video up. And I know he didn't mean it. Uh, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Uh, probably Brother Fogel could confirm that. He deals with Jews all the time. They have a zeal for God. You know, I got, when I was in Israel, it was the funniest thing. Because... Um, you know, like sometimes we're up here and we're preaching and I'll see somebody back there like this. Like, well, yeah, they got a burden for the Bible. And, and or, or do you ever, you know, you're preaching and somebody's not even paying attention. And I'm, we're down at the wailing wall. I'm watching these, you think, dedicated Jews. 
and I'm watching this Jewish guy like, like, like he's like this, and I thought, don't they have any restrooms around here? I'm <laughs> honest. He's like this. He goes, he was checking out who's there. <laughs> I don't see how he can see him. I saw another guy, uh, and he's standing there, you know, and he's got his Bible, but he's, and he's going like this, and he's going, and I thought, oh, look how dedicated. And he goes, I thought they're just like us. They, they got a zeal. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Can that not be said about every person that goes to hell without accepting Christ? You have people that, that reject salvation by grace because they are, they are going about around trying to establish their own righteousness and they are, they are not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God. I'll look at chapter 11. <coughs> chapter 11, <coughs> he says this. <coughs> That's not what he says. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Now think about that. Isn't that what Anderson says? You know, uh, people say, well, you know, there's just some things hard to find in the Bible. Okay, let's just say we want to find out if God has cast away the Jews. Okay, why don't we go to where Paul said, has God cast away the Jews? You might find the answer. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people whom he, uh, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of, Isaiah, uh, of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. I am left alone and they seek my life. So the apostle Paul says, I would be willing to go to hell for Israel. I hope all Israel gets saved. And surely God has not cast away his people. Do you understand that with what I, I could stop now? And if, if the Anderson people really believe the Bible, they couldn't listen to another word the guy says. The Bible always overthrows uh, a little cheap dictator. Uh, second, uh, second point here is scripture that attests to the future intentions of restoring Israel. Now, we're going to go to the sheet, and uh, the, I've highlighted in green. I hope you got a color copy. If you, you should have bought the good tickets. Um, but uh, I've highlighted in green uh, just what... Uh, just what uh, uh, that, that covers the point. By the way, look up uh, on the sheet right under there, under Romans chapter 10, verses uh, 1 through 3, uh, and I put in red my comments. Landerson uh, has more of a burden for, for uh, Israel hating Muslims than he does for the people of Israel. And he does. He comes down in here. I was here in this church a month ago, and they were carrying on some kind of a thing down in Detroit or something, and, and he wears the Palestinian flag on his, where he'd like to have a chest. And... Um, uh, and, and says free Palestine, uh, they, hate, they hate the Jews. Uh, scripture that attests to God's future intention of restoring Israel. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse, uh, verses 3 through 8. And it says this, God says, uh, just read the green, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I've driven them uh, and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now, if that's about us, when were we driven to all countries? If you're going to try to claim that, uh, we have not been driven to all countries. We've gone to all countries. They do it voluntarily. They're called missionaries. Uh, next verse, verse, uh, or, or verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will raise, up, uh, raise unto David a, a righteous branch. Uh, in the red, David's going to be the king over Christians. Look what it says. It says, I'll raise David a righteous branch uh, and a king shall reign and prosper. Do we have a king? Elvis is dead. Uh, verse 6, in his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. Um, and I put the note in there, is Anderson from the house of Israel or Judah? So that's just, you say, well, Jews. What do you do about Judah? He says, we're, we're Israel. Then who's Judah? 
In fact, I, I'm trying to figure out what tribe they are. I think Apache. Um, verse 7, the green, the Lord liveth, which, um, in fact, look what it says, verse, uh, the whole verse. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth with, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country uh, and from all countries where thou have driven them, uh, and they shall dwell in their own land. To this day, God is known as the God of the Exodus of the Jews out of Egypt. And is that not one of the greatest things that took place? Of all the things, and there's, man, there are, this whole Old Testament uh, is filled with the miracles that God performed in the history of Israel, correct? But without a doubt, possibly, other than the giving of the law, which happened during that Exodus, uh, other than the giving of the law, Israel being taking, delivering Israel out of Egypt is probably one of the single greatest thing that he did. And so, so in fact, when Aaron made the false calf, uh, you know, he didn't say this. Aaron didn't say, hey, guys, uh, here's the God that brought us out of Egypt, uh, but I made this golden calf. Let's worship this instead. That is not what Aaron said. He pointed to this golden calf and he said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And if you've ever done anything, it's not pride, okay? If you've ever done anything and someone's tried to take the credit for it, it's just natural to go, hey, pal, I did that. He didn't do that. And that just kind of upsets God. But he said in the future, to this day, Israel still makes a big deal out of being, about, out of being rescued from the, from the nation of Egypt. Right? He said this thing of bringing all the diaspora, all of the Jews from around the world back to the land, and they're not all there yet. There's more, more Jews right now in New York City than there are in Israel. And he said, this thing of, of God bringing all the Jews back into the land is going to be so great that when somebody says, what God do you worship? They won't say, I worship the God that brought Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. They're going to say, I worship the God that brought Israel out of all of the countries where they were dispersed. That's what a huge thing this is. And this one, verse 8, is still future. So if he has done away with, with Israel, verse 8 will never happen. Um, Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, 33 to 38 in verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts uh, and write in their heart uh, and will be their, uh, write it in their heart and will be their God uh, and they shall be my people. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. Um, and, I, and I think where Bill mentioned it, you know, there's a couple of verses that we classically misapply. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man open unto me. And, and you know, I've been winning with people uh, and I've even used it because let me ask you a question here's a lost guy you're dealing with him about his soul doesn't the Lord isn't the Lord dealing with him and doesn't the Lord want to come into his heart and save him I have a problem if I was so somebody you know uh, and they said to the lost guy you know right now the Lord is knocking at your heart's door he wants to come in and save you and, and quoted Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 I wouldn't go that's bad doctrine well, you can make the spiritual application, but you ought to know the historic or the, the, the doctrinal application. Uh, and the doctrinal application is that it's not the Lord knocking on a lost man's heart, trying to save him. It is what Bill said. It's, it's him trying desperately to get a Christian to quit watching reality TV and open their Bible and have some fellowship with God. Let me show you a verse that I have. Oh, this will be the next video. Classically misapplied. Look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8. And maybe you have done this too. Well, I, I shouldn't say classically misapplied. Uh, I have spiritually applied, uh, uh, applied this, but not doctrinally. And in Hebrews chapter 8, now I just read this in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward part and write it in their heart and will be their God and they shall be my people. And here's what he says in eight, uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews, verse 12. Have you ever led somebody to Christ and right after that said, now look what God just did. For I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins 
and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now let me ask you, when a person gets saved, their sins are not just forgiven, they are wiped away, correct? So isn't what I just read true about, about you and I when we first got saved? Okay, about at least two of you. Um, but that's not what that verse is talking about. That verse is the New Testament application of the verse I just read. And if you read before that, he's talking about, uh, and again, uh, Bill said last night, you got the New Testament and you got the New Covenant. Our, our book here is the New Testament, but the New Covenant is going to be with Israel. And God says, when I make the New Covenant with Israel, when I do it, he says, I will be merciful to their, Israel's unrighteousness, and their, Israel's sins, and Israel's iniquities. I remember no more. Guys, if God has written Israel off, that verse will never come true. You understand how much prophecy will never come to fruition if God has written Israel off? Uh, look at verse 36. If those ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Uh, verse, heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath. I will, cast off, I, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel. Uh, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, uh, that the seed shall be built to the Lord uh, from the tower of Hananel unto the gate of the corner. Guys, that hasn't happened. It is future. Um, Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 8 through 15. Just look at verse 15. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses uh, 3 through 26. We won't read them all, just 3 through 25. Um, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city. That's not a prophecy about the people of Israel, that's, that's a prophecy about the structures that they're living in, in Jerusalem. And God has even said, I have a prophecy about that. So it's not about the houses that are in Tempe, Arizona. It's about the houses, the houses, the physical structures that are in Jerusalem. Um, verse seven, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of, of Israel to return and will build them again as, what's the next? At the first. If this is Israel, when the Jews came into the land, God built them, did he not? And if, if this is Israel he's talking about, he says, I'm going to put you back in the land and we're going to go back just like it was when we started. Correct? Let me ask you, if it's us, where's this at the first? Where'd you get an at the first? Um, verse 8, I will cleanse them of all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon their iniquities, uh, whereby they have sinned, uh, and whereby they have tra transgressed against me. You know we are creatures of habit. And I think we get that from God. Uh, that's why, that's why if, you, no matter, if you're from this church or whatever church you go to, don't we always kind of sit in the same place? You probably park your car somewhere in the same part of the parking lot. Uh, you probably gossip. This. Oh, no, wait. Anyway. Um, but we are creatures of habit. Uh, you know that God does things consistently? Did we come from monkeys? No, we did not. We didn't come from gorillas or monkeys or chimpanzees. But did you ever notice that God used the same structure? God used almost the same structure. Then you take that structure, bend it, bend it over, and put it on his front legs, and you you got the quadrupods. I mean, you got everything from dogs to horses. Isn't that true? And so God is a, a creature of habit. He says here what he's going to do to Israel. He's going to cleanse them of all their iniquity. Uh, he will pardon all their iniquities and, and uh, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. The habit of God is to forgive. Aren't you glad? To, to, for God to say their sin is too much is for him to be out of character. That is God being out of character with God. He said, what about the lost? They're going to hell because they didn't trust Christ. He still wouldn't be saved. He said he wasn't willing that any of them should go to hell, that any of them should perish. 
But the fact is that that if God all of a sudden changed, listen, if, if God one time and said, I hate Israel and I'm going to do away with them, I'd say, could I see your credentials? Because I don't think you're the one that wrote this book. Because the same God that is merciful for it, with Israel is merciful with us. And, and you, ought to be, you ought to be glad. Verse 10, again, there shall be a uh, hurt in this place which uh, ye shall, uh, which ye say shall be desolate without man, without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem uh, that, are, that are desolate without man, without inhabitant, and without beast. If, um, if the replacement theology is true, you're not going to heaven, you're going to Jerusalem. Every, every future reference to Israel is we're gone to Jerusalem. So you're not gone to heaven, you're gone to Jerusalem. I've already been there, I'll take heaven. No offense, brother, no offense, but when I was over there, you know, we live in a desert in, in Idaho, and it kind of makes most of the land of Israel look pretty nice. Uh, or, 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 or Israel makes most of Idaho look pretty nice. And I'm, we're driving around, and this place is absolutely, it's dirt and hot. And I told Kathy, I said, I said, God loves this place. Does he not know about Hawaii? I thought he made Hawaii. I, and I don't mean this bad, but when I looked at Israel, even Jerusalem, I said, I don't see anything in this place that would turn God's head. You ever see something turn your head? And I said, what is it that God loves this place? And as soon as I said that, I thought of two individuals. I thought of a harlot named Rahab. I had nothing about her that would turn God's head. And yet, that woman is in the line of Christ. You know the other individuals you thought about that have never turned God's head? Sam Gipp. The God that looks at Israel, that I see nothing of value, and he goes, man, I love this place. And if you're honest and you look at yourself, you shouldn't see anything of value. And God says, yeah, yeah that's my kid right there. I love him. That's how God feels about you. You are as, you are as appealing as a desert. And yet God got his heart for you. Um, praise the Lord of hosts, the God of, uh, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever, except with Israel. Uh, and, uh, and of them that shall bring sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Oh, they're going to they're gonna be having services in the house of the Lord. I will cause to return the captivity of the land, here again, as at first. That's the captivity. Is that the captivity of the people of Israel? No. It's the captivity of the land. He talks about restoring Israel, but he talked earlier about restoring, uh, he said, I'm going to take care of the houses in the city. Here he's saying, I'm even going to, even the land, because has the land of Israel been in captivity? And he said, I'm going to restore it as the first. Well, how was it at, at, at the first? The Jews were there. Not a bunch of Bible-thumping, New Testament quoting Christians. Well, that wouldn't really be in anyway. Uh, verse 14, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. I ask in the is Anderson from the house of Israel or Judah. When these guys say we're Israel, then tell me who's Judah. I'd like to know who Judah is because if, he's, if we're Israel, someone is Judah. May, I don't know if they're coming from out of space or what, but uh, somebody is out there that's Judah. Verse um, 16, uh, Judah be uh, in those days shall Judah be saved, and Israel shall dwell safe. Or Jerusalem shall dwell safely. No one can say Israel dwell, or Jerusalem dwells safely. I mean, they go shop. They don't. You get you guys. You know, you get the three automatic in your pocket. They got teenage girls with 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 uh, M16s over their shoulder. Say, where are you going, mall? If somebody does that in this country, it's because they're going to shoot it up. Verse 17, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. So there's going to be a king in the Davidic line who is going to sit over the house of Israel, which means we are destined to sit under David as our king. That is so contrary to New Testament doctrine, it's not even funny. 
Uh, neither shall the priests of the Levites want a man before me. Oh, so there's, look at this. To offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to sacrifice continually. Temple worship shall be restored. And we're going to be doing it? Because if we're Israel, I wonder if those guys are the Levites. Somebody's going to have to be the Levites and temple worship is going to be restored. And so I guess we're going to be going to the temple killing sheep. That's what, that's what um, Anderson's people are doing today, killing sheep. Verse 20, if, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, uh, and that there should uh, not be day and night in their season. Now, somebody's going to go, well, the Bible says that there's no need of the sun in the New Jerusalem. There's no need of it. He didn't say there would be a break in the covenant. Uh, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to, to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. Verse 24, Considereth uh, thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord hath chosen uh, shall even be cast off. Thus they have despised my people. That is a prophetic reference to Steve Anderson. He said, somebody's going to say, my people are cast off and they despise my people. I am telling you that every follower of Stephen Anderson despises Israel. That is not, that spirit of, of hatred, they did not get that from, they did not get that from this God. They got that from the God of the world. That they should be no more a nation before thee, thus saith the Lord, if my covenant... Uh, be not with day and night. If I have not pointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob uh, and um, David my servant, so that I will not take away, uh, I'm sorry, and I will not uh, yeah, take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, according to Romans 4, we are of the spiritual lineage of Abraham. None of, except for Brother Fogel, maybe somebody else here, none of us are of the physical seed. Do you know why Abraham blessed God? Because God told him something that was absolutely outrageous and unbelievable. And he went, ah, you say so? So what God, what if this old man and said, stars, see all them stars? Oh yeah, a lot of stars. Hey, they've been trying to have kids for years. No kids. And God says, I'm going to give you kids like the stars of the sky and like the sand of the sea. Now, that was one of the craziest things that old man ever heard. And if anybody else would have told him, he'd have said, what have you been smoking? But when God said it, he said, I believe it. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. He wasn't looking forward to the cross. He was looking forward to having kids like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. God told him something that, was, that would sound absolutely, unbelievably crazy, and this guy believed it just because God said it. Do you know why we are the spiritual seed of Abraham? Because God told you something that is absolutely, unbelievably crazy. You say, what? That 2,000 years ago, a man walked this earth, and that that man was not just a human, but he was God in the flesh, that he died on the cross before your great-grandfather was a thought. And yet when he died 2,000 years ago, he somehow paid for your sins. And then three days, three nights later, he came back to life and then floated on up to heaven. And all you got to do is say, I'll take what he went through, his death, burial, and resurrection as a payment for my sins, and, and you go to heaven. I'm sorry, guys. Well, I think that's wonderful. I think it's crazy. I believe it. Don't, don't cut the last part off, Steve. I believe it. But guys, if you're honest, in fact, isn't that why some of you rejected the gospel for a long time? Because you said, that's too crazy. It makes more sense that I should have to suffer for my sins. It makes more sense that I should have to do works uh, to, to pay for my sins. That makes sense to natural man. And yet when you got saved, you were a natural man and you believe something just as crazy as Abraham. And that's when God said, that's how I can tell their kin, spiritually. But there isn't a drop of Abrahamic blood in my veins and probably not a drop in most of yours. Now, don't go to ancestors.com. Good night. 
What do you care? Two things never go to. Never, never go to ancestors.com and find out where your kinfolk were. I saw this advertisement and this doofus guy. I can't, oh, he, oh, he was, uh, he said, uh, 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 he's all dressed like a Scotman. I thought it was a Scotman. And they went to ancestors.com and they found out I'm a Nazi. I'm a German. Don't go. What do you care? Because here's what you'll do. You'll go there and all of a sudden you'll go, gee, I, I want sour cleaners. I, I, those, like those stupid books you read about the four temperaments, there's nobody in this room that is 100% of any one of them. And as soon as you've, you'll pick the one you like and then you'll start adding the other characteristics. Well, that's just how, you know, I'm a sanguine. You know what a sanguine is? Yeah, I know what a sanguine is. A little black and white bird lives in Antarctica, walks like that. People give me no credit whatsoever. And don't go find out what your high school graduate friends are doing. They don't care about you. And, and you'll stumble upon your old girlfriend and then wonder how you ended up back together. You idiot. Um, so that I will not take away of his seed of the, uh, to be rulers over that seed, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have no seed from Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return. We were never in captivity. And have mercy upon them. Hosea chapter 2, verse uh, 17, I will take away the names of Balaam out of the mouth. Uh, when was, the, was that name in the mouth of Christians? There might have been, it might have been, you know, Baal worship is really, uh, Roman Catholicism was really old time Baal worship. So, like, I was a Roman Catholic, and if you were Roman Catholic, then we are in Baal worship. But it's never been in my mouth since I got saved, since I became the replacement for Israel, according to Steve Anderson. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, looked at the bottom of page 4, verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, let me tell you, I just got to tell you this, I like Ezekiel because God said something, said something that sounded stupid to him. This is 37 where he sees the, the, the valley of dry bones and God says, uh, hey, son of man, can these bones live? There isn't a sane person on the planet that knows, does not know the answer to that is, of course not. You have never looked at a bone and said, uh, I'll bet it can live again. I just get them chicken bones. I just want them to have re refilled, you know, recycled. But, um, but here's, what, here's what Ezekiel says. Look at it. Uh, look at verse 3. And he said, Son of man, can these bones live? And I like this answer. And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. He said, I know they can't, but if you want them to. So the answer, you know, it's that old thing about, I have a bird in my hand. Is it alive or is it dead? Because if it's alive and you say it's alive, the guy crushes it and then he gives it to you dead. So you were wrong. This is a great one for Calvinists. And if, it, and if you say dead, then he turns it back alive and you're wrong. It's a lot like the government. And so, um, but you know what God says? He, he, I, like, I like Ezekiel. He said, I know these bones can't live, but if you want to live, that's it. Are these bones going to and those are the bones of Israel, the physical bones of Israel. Uh, 37, page 5, 37, 21 through 28. Look at verse 21. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone. Now, are we among the heathen? Come on. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Are we among the heathen? Yes. But we haven't gone among them. We got saved among them. We were them, were we not? But we haven't gone among them. We, we, if you got saved yesterday, you live in the same house that you lived in yesterday or the before, year before, you've always been amongst the heathen. Where they have gone and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. I'm telling you, if, if, if Herbert W. Armstrong and his disciple Steve Anderson are correct, we are not going to heaven. We are going to Jerusalem. 
and one king shall be king to them all. So we're going to have a king. Now, I'm going to have a king, but he's going to have holes in his hands. And as great a man as David was, and God says God's going to resurrect David, and he does say that, um, he's not going to be, David's not going to be my king. Fact is, Jesus is my king right now. I'd have to wait. Uh, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Are we two nations? You see, understand, you can't apply this to us, which is why the funniest thing is not that Anderson's people are biblically ignorant. It is that I have heard Anderson himself uh, uh, berate them for not reading the Bible. What a fool, man. If his people start reading the Bible, probably, you know, he is, he is having an exodus of his own right now. People are flocking away from him. They're leaving him by the droves. And um, the reason they're doing it is probably because they listened to him one time and he was right. They'd read the Bible. Uh, verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them. That is future. Verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them, uh, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, uh, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. That is Israel. Um, verse 28, the heathen shall know that I, am the Lord, uh, that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. The heathen will know when God sanctifies Israel, they'll know that it was God that did it, correct? All right, now stop and think about this. Herbert W. Armstrong is correct. Anderson is correct in following him like a, like a puppy. And God is done with the Jews that are living over there right now. He has nothing to do with the, with the people who know us Israelites today. It's really us. So here's all these heathens surrounding the nation of Israel. And God is going to, I guess, you know, have them, those guys uh, evicted. And we're going to move in. And then he's gonna, God's going to look at all the heathen around and say, see how I took care of Israel? And all he's going to say, you just threw them out. You brought this bunch of Gentiles from, from Michigan. You Michiganders are there. I don't want to be there. Ezekiel 38, 8, after many days, thou shalt be visited in the latter years. You shall come into the land brought back from the sword. Uh, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. That restoration is always physical. It is always about the land. It is always about the Jews. It is always about the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's always about the physical two nations of Israel and Judah. You and I are not in that picture. Don't, like I said, don't you have enough promises from God? You got to steal the Jews' promise. Amos eight or nine verse eight. I will not utterly destroy the of Jacob. God, what you have right there, you need to mark Amos 9, 8 as one of God's many lies if Steve Anderson is right. God said he will not utterly de destroy the house of Jacob. And yet if he does, he, has, he lied in that verse. Amos 9, 14, I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. When have we been in captivity? Obadiah 117, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Uh, page 6, Micah chapter 2 and verse 12. <coughs> I, will, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. Uh, you know, we've never, we're not a remnant of anything. We're the, we're the whole body of saved people who are alive at this minute. We aren't the whole body of saved people. There's a bunch of dead Christians, correct? But we are the whole body of everybody that, uh, that's alive right now that's trusted Christ. We're not the remnant. Micah chapter 5, verses 7 and 9, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as from the Lord. The next verse, the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles. Shall be. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 7, the coast uh, and the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. All right, so now come on. He has stated the remnant of the house of Jacob, the remnant of the house of Judah, the remnant of the house of Israel. 
You better, you better put a dartboard up there, put all three of those on, throw a dart, find out which one you're in. Because there's three of them. And, and once you identify yours, then tell me who the other two are. Zephaniah uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Ooh. Oh, man. Did you, ever have a, did you ever have just something flash into your mind and it kind of made you want to throw up? It said, sing, O daughter of Zion. And I just saw a picture of Anderson's face. He's the daughter of Zion. I'll bet Zion is not proud of that face. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all thy heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Uh, he, this might be him. It's talking about a daughter. Verse 16, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. Uh, verse 19, and gather her that was driven out. When were Christians driven out? Um, verse 20, uh, at that time will I bring you, bring you again, again, uh, even in time, that I, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth uh, when I turn back your captivity before their eyes, saith the Lord. Could you imagine if God could say today to the world, I have, I have brought the Christians back from captivity. The whole world would go from captivity where? Where, 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 where were we held captive? Now you can say, well, you know, some of them were alcoholics and they were captive to that and some were on drugs and some weren't. But the nation of Israel, it's a corporate description. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 10, O daughter of Zion, verse 11, uh, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, verse 12, the Lord shall inherit Judah, uh, his portion in the holy land. You might mark that down. When somebody says holy land is not a description, well, God called that place the holy land. Uh, and shall choose Jerusalem again, again. When did he choose before? When was it at the first? It was when the Jews were there. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Um, just look at the top page 7, verse 6. The remnant of what people? What does it say? This people. So here's God. He is pointing at, Jews, at the Jews and he's telling them, remnant of this people. And when he points it, he says, the remnant of this people. And when he says that, Anderson says, well, when he says that, he's talking about us. Right? When he talks in the Old Testament about, about all the few things about Israel, that's about us. That's what I'm telling you, the guys. You talk about hyper-dispensational. He's hyperventilating. Zechariah chapter, I love this. Man, these are two of my favorite verses in the Bible. I love this. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord, and Lord of, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass, all future, that ten men, why ten people? Gentiles. That ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Let me just give you a little sidebar. You see that God is with you? You know what that is? That's Emmanuel. He says that in Isaiah. His name should be Emmanuel, God with them. I point out that, let me ask you something. Was Jesus ever called Emmanuel during his earthly ministry? No. You say, why? Because he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. So he was not with them. So he was given the name Jesus because that's Jehovah saves and that's what we needed and that's what Israel needs, all right? But if it says his name's gonna be Emmanuel, and this, this, this isn't even deep Bible, but it's too deep for the bonehead in, in Arizona. Um, someday his name's going to be Emmanuel. You just saw it. Someday in the future, People from all the nations of the world will see a Jew and they'll grab a hold of his skirt. Whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. You going to Jerusalem? Yeah. Can I go with you? Because we've heard God is, is with you. You want to see, you want to see future? Keep, keep your, I know you know we're not looking. Look at um, Revelation chapter 21. 
And sometimes we draw a timeline. And we do this. Well, we don't all do that. And we go like this. Genesis 1-1 to Revelation chapter 22. All right? Let me explain something about Stephen Anderson. You say, why do you keep talking about him? Because he's out of hell and because he is destroying churches and he is a wolf. Okay? Well, I don't like you to hear, hear you talk. Then do this. Because I am telling you, I am in there. I Every single week, every church I'm in, someone comes and tells me, here's what Anderson did, here's what his people did, here's what his people did. I am telling you people that Stephen Anderson is more of a threat to our churches than the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons put together. And, and, and here's how I explain Stephen Anders. You know, uh, our, our youngest son, I remember uh, Luke, Luke was having trouble in the second grade with math. Uh, and he just couldn't get, you know, the simple math. And by the time he graduates, now he gets, he gets he'll, see, he'll be with us, and he'll start talking algebra with my wife. You say, why? Because he knows I can understand a thing he's saying. Because when he's talking to her about algebra, he's looking at me and smiling. I hate that kid. Well, here is Stephen Anderson. He's a second grader. I didn't say he's not saved. He might not be. But I've not been convinced yet. Um, but he is, spiritually, he is a second grader. Okay? I, well, he's around 12, so he's probably more like a sixth grader. And he's a, he's a sixth grader that is lucky to get plus three and get the same answer three times in a row. And Bible, any Bible knowledge, like Brother Bill was talking about last night, any study of the scripture goes beyond, so far beyond his ability to understand it. So you got a sixth grader who's barely doing two plus two and somebody gets an algebra equation, he didn't even understand it. So he says, that's blasphemy. He has codified biblical ignorance. Because here is how this should be drawn. Ours isn't Genesis 1-1. Ours is Genesis 1-2. You say, well, it's only one verse. Oh, yeah, but between 1-1 and 1-2, there's a lot of space goes on. We're not going into that because some of you don't have a seatbelt on your pew. And ours ends at 20. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Is it Revelation chapter 20 at the end of the millennium? The end of our 7,000 year period? <coughs> In Revelation chapter 20, you have the, the um, uh, look at verse 12, and I saw the dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were open. And a book was open. Uh, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, hey, isn't that a cool word? Isn't that funny God used the same word for the people that go to hell that he used for the people who trust Christ? I'm going to prophesy. Every person on this planet is going to die a whosoever. They're going to be a whosoever trust, uh, called upon the name of the Lord and got saved or a whosoever was not found written in the book of life and was cast in the lake of fire. That's the end of our time. Then look what happens after that. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now why is God with you? And heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God with men. And he will dwell with them. God with them. Emmanuel. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them. Three times in that verse, Emmanuel, 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 God with us. That is future. He is not with us now. I am not going to give you a whole bunch of this. But I am taking into Brother Sluter's time right now. You got the notes? Uh, I just want to show you 
the very uh, page eight. You guys know a place called Calvary? I do. I've been there twice. Once spiritually, once physically. I went there spiritually June 14th, 1970. I went there physically October something in 2014. Isn't it funny? I visited there spiritually before I ever got there physically. That's hard to do, but I did it. But here's the thing, guys. If you believe in a place called Calvary, you have only one reason on the planet. And that one reason is Luke 23, verse 33. Uh, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they crucified him, the malefactors, one, hand, one on the right hand, the other on the left. That is the sole, single, one time the word Calvary appears in Scripture. And you believe in Calvary, right? Well, you can count them on your own. But in this little study here, and this is not complete, there are 138 verses about the future restoration of Israel. That is, that is 137 more than the Bible has about Calvary. You believe the Lord ascended into heaven after his, death, after his resurrection? Well, if you do, you do it for only three reasons. Look at the ascension. Mark chapter 16, verse 19, he was received into heaven. Luke 24, 51, and carried up into heaven. Acts 1, 9, uh, he was taken up. That's the only three places it's recorded. But you believe in the ascension, right? I'll bet the dodo in Arizona, he knows, he probably thinks he's going to ascend. But... Um, there's only three verses for the ascension. It's a major doctrine with us. But there's more verses on the restoration of Israel. So if you're going to get rid of all of those verses, why are you hanging on to these? Oh, because you like what these say. The birth of Jesus Christ. There are 18 verses. We have the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. We have the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Look, there may be some Old Testament prophecies that I've overlooked. I say 18 verses. Let's just stretch it to 25 that maybe I've overlooked some. But then you have the records in Matthew chapter 18, verse 25, uh, Matthew 2, 1, and Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, the birth of Jesus Christ. There's 138 verses documenting the establishment of Israel. There are more than that. Uh, that's more documentation than the word Calvary, the ascension, or the birth of Jesus Christ. I didn't say I don't believe in the birth of Jesus Christ or the ascension uh, or, or uh, Calvary. I said I believe in with far less scriptural evidence than the Bible has on the restoration of Israel. And so if somebody wants to believe on, in Calvary, you should. In the birth of Christ, you should. Uh, the, the ascension of Jesus Christ, you should. You have no way, you have no option to say, but I don't believe in the restoration of Israel. How could you, how could you ignore and reject that much scripture when you'll take you believe in Calvary based on only one verse? You'll believe in the, the uh, ascension of Jesus Christ based on only one verse. Thank you.
like encompass what Israel is about and what how God works and Amen. You may be seated. And uh, we heard, I don't even know how, on Facebook, I saw the back of the Bible broadcast, and um, I was watching that. And uh, and by the way, that's better than anything else on Thursdays at 8.30. And uh, so you can watch that. And I was watching that, and I saw Brother Suter, I don't remember what it was you said, but it clued in my mind that it reminded me of something what Bill Grady would say. I thought, I think he knows Bill Grady. And the more I watched him, I thought, I like him. And, uh, and so I just uh, had, uh, it was neat to see him. And I'm glad that he's with us. We've got Brother Sluter, and uh, I'm just uh, glad the Lord worked it out, Brother Sluter. I'm glad we're able to meet in person. And why don't you come and uh, preach to us the Word of God. Amen. Now, this, this glass, I think this side is okay. So if you took out this side over here. Let's talk the glass is water. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll go to 12:15. Fantastic. All right. He says I have till 12:15, uh, but I don't like to even hear myself that long. So uh, we'll be out before then. Amen. It is a privilege to be here, and uh, I feel like uh, I feel like a grasshopper amongst giants this morning. So preaching with Brother Gip and Brother Grady, and uh, boy, I tell you, uh, Brother Gip, I remember you talking about focusing on the things God focuses on in the Bible a long time ago. And if we're going to be honest, for example, uh, what was Jesus' favorite verse? The Bible never says that this was Jesus' favorite verse, but if we're going on how many, the verses he quoted, his favorite verse was about hell. He quoted the verse in the Old Testament about hell more than any other verse. So if we're going to go by what God's favorite topic is, according to how many times it's mentioned in the Bible, it's not soul winning. I like soul winning. We do it twice a week at my church. But according to the Bible, God's favorite topic is the future restoration of Israel. Okay, it's like the day, what is the greatest day in your life? I mean, you saw what it What's the greatest day in your life? When I got saved. Hello? But what's the greatest day in the life of Jesus? When he gets to come back and reclaim what's rightfully his. Amen, amen. All right, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews this morning, the book of Hebrews. This is my first time in Michigan. It's my first time ever preaching up north. This is my third time across the Mason-Dixon line. I went, uh, yeah, I went, I went downstairs and I'm thinking, man, they're going to have grits. They're going to have sawmill gravy. Hello. Some of that whole hog sausage. Amen. And I remember. Up north, y'all had bagels. Anyway, no. <laughs> Amen. You can't have bacon at a Jewish meeting, right? Isn't that the rules? Can't have whole hog sausage. Hey, anyway. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's rest from our seats for just a moment. We're only going to read two verses in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 13. Everybody stand for just a moment in reverence the reading of God's word. Hebrews. Do I have a water up here, brother? Is there, is there a water? Somebody... Yeah, somebody said I never heard a windmill run on water to me preach. So, anyway, all right, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews is the hall of faith, right? All the Old Testament saints mention. And notice what the Bible says about these Old Testament saints. These all died in what? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. From Genesis 
all the way to Revelation, a man is always, his salvation is always involving faith. There's always faith involved. I'm gonna exp I'll get into that a little later on in the message, but there's always faith. These all died in faith, but notice the next phrase, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Look at verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through, there's that word again, faith, received not the what? Promise. I want to preach on the thought this morning, Old Testament salvation, what did they know? Old Testament salvation, what did they know? The Bible says they knew bits and pieces, but they never, they saw them afar off. But the Bible says they never obtained those promises. They died having not received the promise. Isn't that what the Bible says? Let's pray this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, thank you for letting us be in church this morning. God, I pray you help us as we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Now, here's the interesting thing about, about these verses. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, we find the word faith mentioned over and over. It's the great hall of faith chapter. Now, the, the Bible says these Old Testament saints, they died without receiving the promises, and the Bible says they saw them afar off, but they never received them. Now, here's the thing, folks. I don't have very good vision. If I were to take my glasses off, I, luckily I can't see any faces on the front row. Hello, amen. I'm teasing, all right? But when you're looking afar off, you can see maybe the outline of something. Or you can maybe see the image of something, but you can't see very well afar off. Amen? Now, I want you to notice this. I want you to go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Now, remember, they died in faith not receiving the promise, Luke chapter 18 and verse number 31. Luke chapter 18 and verse 31. All right, now while we're there, you, sir, here on the front row, I want you to go to Matthew 16, 21 through 23. I want you to go to Mark chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. I want you to go to Luke 24, 45. I want you to go to John 2, 22. And you, sir, go to John 20, verse 8 and 9. I'm going to have them read. We won't go. We won't turn our Bibles to all these places. I'll have them read them. You can write these down. But I want you to look at Luke 18, 31. Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, that's the disciples, the apostles, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by who? The prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So notice, everything he's about to mention has been by the prophets. Understand that? For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on and they shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again. Now what did we just read? We just read the gospel. The death according to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 3 and 4 we just read the gospel by which me and you are saved. Amen. The gospel, the grace of God. And the Bible says all of that was recorded in the prophets. Isn't that what it says? But I want you to notice the reaction of the disciples. Verse 34. And they, under, a threefold cord, is, uh, threefold cord is not easily broken, right? So watch the threefold cord of their ignorance. They understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Old Testament saints were saved by looking forward to the cross. Man, listen, don't you dare look at me in the face and say, the Old Testament saints understood the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus when the guys who were with them for three and a half years didn't even understand it. You're going to tell me that the men who lived with Jesus for three and a half years knew about the death, burial, and resurrection, uh, or did, didn't know about the death, burial, and resurrection, yet Abraham did? David did, Moses did. All right, who had, what, what do you have? Read it loud. Read it real loud. 
Matthew 16. Yeah, 22 and 23. From that time forth, he began to show his disciples. Keep on reading. Suffer many things. Skip down to verse 23. Savor us not the things which be of God, but things which be of man. So when Jesus talks about being crucified, Peter was looking forward to the cross so much, he grabs the Lord and rebukes him. Be it far from thee, Lord. Yeah, they were looking for a suffering Savior, right? All right, what did you have? Mark 9, 9 and 10, read it real loud. Do your best preacher voice. As they're coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he says, I don't want you to tell anybody what you've seen. And if you'll go and read Mark 9, I believe it's Mark 9, maybe the one in Luke, but what do they talk about? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are on top of the mountain. Does anybody know what they talked about? Huh? They talked about his decease. They were talking about the gospel. The disciples are literally hooked in, looking at him as Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are talking about the gospel. All right, read on. He said, don't tell anybody, thank you, sir. Don't tell anybody what you've seen or what we've talked about till after I've risen from the dead. Okay, Jesus. What in the heck's he talking about? <laughs> Rising from the dead, this guy's supposed to be sitting on the throne. Not rising from the dead. All right, what do you have? Luke 24, 45, stand up and read it real loud. The two disciples on the Emmaus Road, Luke 24, he shows up and says, Why are you so sad? Man, the guy which we thought that should redeem and restore is. They killed him three days ago. He's dead. He's gone. Our hope is lost. We've spent three and a half years following this guy, and he's dead. And the Bible says he starts with the Psalms and the law and goes all the way through and says, can you guys not see me in all this? And then the Bible says understanding was opened. All right, which one did you have? John 2.22. I'd like that one. Stand up and read it loud. you a question when did the disciples remember that Jesus said I'm gonna die be buried and, rise again? and when did they believe the Bible says they believed the scripture that was written about, when did they believe the scripture about him dying and rising from the dead after the resurrection I mean I, you get to wondering if some of these fundamentalists have literally read the Bible I mean, I'm, be, I'm not being ugly. I'm being honest. Have they? I mean, one scripture, two, three, four, five. Which one do you, did I give you one? Read it. Wait a second. Say, here, come here. Can you say that part one more time? Read that whole verse again. Number nine. Whichever the last one you read was. For as they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. This thing on. Yeah. For yet he knew not the scripture. The Bible says when they go into the tomb and see the empty tomb. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it until I can. The empty tomb, whatever, man. Let me put my fingers through the nail prints. Now, Jack Kyles gave me soul winning. I'll forever, Bob Gray Sr., man, my church every year and does a soul winning conference. I love that man. And I don't know what he believes, and I'm not going to say what he believes. I don't know. But unto the Lord, why on God's green earth are we still propagating this idea that Old Testament saints were saved by looking forward to the cross? 
we have six or seven scripture passages that clearly state that not even the disciples understood it. Folks, what we need to understand is they were not looking for a suffering Savior. They were looking for a reigning king. John, go to John chapter 6, verse 15. John chapter 6 and verse 15. John 6, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to do what? To crucify him. No, to do what? To make him king, the Jews are not looking, looking for a suffering Savior. You say, but what about Isaiah 53? What about Psalms 22? See, what you've got to understand, folks, is that those Old Testament saints, as Clarence Larkin so aptly put it, they saw the mountain peaks of prophecy. Go to 2 Peter, or excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse number 10 through 12. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 10. Look at what it says. In fact, look at verse number 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. First Peter is a tribulation passage. We won't have time to get into that. But the end of my faith is not the salvation of my soul. The beginning of my faith was salvation of my soul. But he that shall endure to the end. First, anybody tries to tell you First Peter is not a tribulation book, just write them off. There's so many, we don't have time to get all that. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, not them. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. So they were searching what manner of time it was. They were confused about the timeline. You say, how so? We'll look at the rest of verse number 11. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should what? Follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us. So watch this. When, the, when, the, when Isaiah is writing down Isaiah 53. Now what comes for Isaiah 53? What comes for Isaiah 52? 51 and 50. 51, or 50, 51, 52, if you study those passages, those passages talk about the day of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, after reading these, this triumphal battle of, of God winning the battle of Armageddon, all of a sudden he writes Isaiah 53 down. They were looking forward so much to the suffering Savior that in Acts chapter number 8, we find a man reading Isaiah 53, and he looks at Philip and said, who in the world is he talking about, himself or some other man? If Jews were looking forward to the cross, he would know that's talking about the Messiah. So they saw the mountain peaks of prophecy. They saw the Calvary, but they also saw, not Calvary in its extent, but they saw the sufferings of the Savior, and they saw the reigning of the Savior, the crowning of the King. But what they could not see was what? The valley of the church. Because the church was a mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament. We have pictures of the church, yeah, but without a... You cannot have a type without what? An anti-type. That means if there was no church, we would never know about the types in the Old Testament. Somebody so aptly put it, well, they didn't have Calvary in the Old Testament. They had pictures of Calvary where if I'm drowning, throw me a rope, not a picture of a rope, okay? Hello? Forward to the, so my message, what did the Old Testament saints know? They saw these pictures. They saw these. They saw them fall off, but they never received the promise. It's very obvious they were not looking forward to the cross to be saved. Looking, uh, looking forward to the cross to be saved. We look back to the cross to be saved, but they didn't look forward to the cross. Now the modern fundamentalists. I've, I've come up with three basic objections that they have to this idea. Now you, you say, well, preacher, how? What were they? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. But there are three objections, though, that, that when we stand up as Bible believers and say, they were not saved by looking forward to the cross. There's three main objections. Now, you may have heard some other ones, okay? 
I never cease to be I never cease to be amazed at some of the answers I get out of people who don't read their Bibles. Amen. It's like an artesian well of stupid. Now look at the first the first point here. The first point. Notice. Say something like this. Oh, hell, hell. Let, let me get this first. It's obvious the Old Testament saints also didn't go to heaven, right? They went to Abraham's bosom. The verse doesn't say unto Abraham's bosom. It says into Abraham's bosom. It's paradise. John 3, 13, Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven except he which came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Nobody, Listen, nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Christ. Well, Enoch was translated that he might not see death. He wasn't. He was translated right into Abraham's bosom. Never said Enoch went to heaven. Now watch this. So in, re in, in response to that, and by the way, you know, Stephen Anderson doesn't believe in paradise. Stephen Anderson does not believe that Old Testament saints went to paradise. He believes they went straight to heaven. I'm going to show you the heresy in that in just a moment. But he said that they just all went to heaven. How many, now, how many of you have seen the video where those two guys jumped me on my bus route? Has anybody seen that? A few of you. They come up and they video record me on the bus route and they start bashing me about paradise. I mean, they just start going at it. Stephen Anderson has to change his position based off that video because I show him Luke 18 and all this stuff and I say, did the disciples, they said, well, the disciples, the Old Testament say they were saved by the gospel. Saved by the gospel. So the first point they'll make, the Old Testament say, saved by the same gospel me and you are saved by and what's the one verse they'll always quote the gospel that was preached unto Abraham you've been misquoting that verse your entire life and so have I there was never any gospel preached to Abraham go to Galatians 3 8 let's read it Look at Galatians 3, 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen. Now, here's the interesting thing. Dr. Ruckman taught me one time, or not me, I was listening to his videos. I never met, met the man. I'll meet him in heaven. But there was no scripture in the time of Abraham, right? Who says this? The Lord says it, right? There's no scripture then. But the New Testament uses the word because that's that that anything God ever spoke is scripture whether it's recorded or not and look what he says Note closely that God justified the heathen through faith preached the gospel unto Abraham what one word did I leave out that everybody leaves out when I hear him quote the verse before the gospel the gospel was not preached to Abraham Notice what the message is saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. He's not preaching the gospel unto Abraham. He's preaching before the gospel that all nations would be blessed. That verse isn't saying Abraham heard the gospel. That verse is saying that Abraham's heard something before the gospel. The speaker saying amen as well. Abraham had a foretaste of the gospel. Listen, when God said, Abraham, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed, did he sit there and think, amen, I'm gonna have, one day one of my descendants is going to be the Messiah and die on the cross and pay for their sins and rise again from the dead? And the... No. Now, are all nations of the earth blessed through Jesus? Yeah. Amen and amen. But did Abraham know it was going to be by the death, burial, and resurrection? No. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. All right, so they'll say, well, the gospel is preached unto Abraham. Never says that. Abraham believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. Yeah, but what does he believe? Nobody ever bothers to go back to Genesis 15 and actually read what God said and what Abraham believed. It doesn't say the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. All right, objection number two they'll give. Everybody stay with me right here, okay? They'll say, well, the Old Testament saints were saved by faith. Doesn't Hebrews 11 talk about faith? All throughout. But see, here's the 
thing. A lot of fundamentals, all, every one of them, and maybe even some people here in this room. Because I hear that all the time, but that faith, faith, faith. You hear the word faith and automatically think grace. You're like a Calvinist. A Calvinist hears predestination and also thinks of election and foreknowledge. Those, all three of those words are different words and they can't be used inter interchangeably. But you think of the word faith and automatically you hear grace. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. But guys, the Old Testament saints didn't have the grace that me and you have. Grace is, grace is mentioned in the Bible 159 times. 39 of those are in the Old Testament. Only six of those are God showing any type of grace. And the interesting thing about the Old Testament, if you look at grace, almost every single time, almost every single time grace is found, somebody is finding the grace. It's not God giving the grace. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Okay, for example, Noah finds what? Grace. One of my most favorite preachers down south will butcher that verse. It says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and me and you can find that same grace. No, we can't. Because Noah finds grace because his ways were perfect and he walked with God. Noah, Listen, Noah finds grace, but if Noah doesn't build an ark, he dies in condemnation with the rest of the world. Well, but they, but they had faith. You better believe they had faith. See, the thing is, is like I said, you hear faith and automatically you think grace because you're a New Testament Gentile saved by grace through faith. But everybody that had faith, it doesn't mean they automatically had grace. See, grace and works cannot mix. Romans eleven six. 6, we won't go there for sake of time, but Romans eleven six 6 clearly says, if it's by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. Grace and works cannot mix, but James chapter 2 clearly says faith and works can mix. So in the Old Testament, they had faith. And here's the reality we've got to swallow. They also had works. We'll get into that in just a second. Let me give you the third objection. This is the one the Stephen Anderson crowd uses. Now, what I'm about to say, I want everybody to just listen, listen to what I'm going to say. And, 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 and I want you to follow me in the scriptures very closely on this, okay? Brother Grady said, if there's one point in the entire message I should be nervous about, it's this one, okay? They'll say this, well, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Therefore, because he was slain from the foundation of the world, those Old Testament saints could get on in, on, in on his sacrifice Therefore, they never had to go to paradise. They could go straight to heaven. Okay, everybody okay? Fasten up real quick. The Bible never says Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Let's go to it. Revelation 13, 8. But it clearly says that, preacher. Let's go there. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Watch this. All right, everybody get this timeline. Very complex here. No. Hey, some people need this, this end. Somebody say amen. Say amen right there, Brother Tucker. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody tell Brother Randy that, okay? He needs that time. Watch this. His names were not what? Hang on, let me, let me do it this way. Whose names were not what? Written. Somebody keep reading it. I've not memorized this one. It's the last verse I've got to memorize. I have the whole Bible down. What is it? Whose names were not written? In the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There it is, preacher. Of the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of what? Preacher, what in the world are you talking about? 
it is right there in the King James Bible that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, we're cross-referencers, right? Whose names were not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation? Did I write it right? We're not, oh. Surprise, I've gone to Universal. Anyway, uh, whose they are not. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Oh, man. Man, y'all are finding out I'm Universal and I don't use the King James Bible. Yeah. Too many grammar rules up here, man. Anyway. <laughs> All right, did I get it right? Am I, am I good? Okay. Great, did me well. All right, now I want you to go to Revelation chapter... Preacher, it says right here, the book of the, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now we're cross-referencing. One of the signs of a Bible-believing, dispensationalist, rightly dividing Bible believer is that they cross-reference. Cross-referencing is the, not a key, but the key to learning the Bible. There are other things that'll help you, but cross-referencing is a must. Go to Revelation 17:8. Somebody read Revelation 17, 8. That's an, that, thank you, Brother Kelly. That's enough. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. What phrase is left out? If we're going to be cross-referencers and comparing Scripture with Scripture, what's not, what is from the foundation of the world? It's not the Lamb slain. It's their names not being written in the book. Everybody see that? So this, now I do know this. This is a prepositional phrase. Referring back to what? The book of life. It's the book of life of the Lamb slain. But from the foundation of the world, that's referring to the names not being written. Jesus wasn't slain from the foundation of the world. If that's the case, then why did he even have to die 2,000 years ago? You need further evidence? Go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25. Hebrews 9, 25. You there? Say amen. amen. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place every year with the blood of others. Verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, what's that next word? Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That means that anything before Calvary, Calvary could not apply to anybody prior to it. It's what the book says. He was not slain from the foundation of the world. And the Bible says he appeared once 2,000 years ago to put away sin. That means sin wasn't put away yet. Nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Christ on the mercy seat in heaven. Therefore, no Old Testament saint ever went to heaven before Calvary. Now, here, remember how I told you I've got two people sitting in my church that came over on the paradise issue, got a third one who's visiting, that were in the Stephen Anderson movement. This is what brought them over. The guy told me this on the phone. I was in Mexico. A guy called me. He's a nice guy. He said, I've been following Stephen Anderson for a while now, but I started listening to your stuff on paradise. And this is what he said. Now, watch this. He said, 
if it's true, and I believe it is, that the Old Testament saints did not go to heaven before Calvary, there must be a reason why they could not go to heaven. And if they, if I die now, I go to heaven. But if they died then, they didn't go to heaven. So therefore, things must have worked differently then. Woo! <laughs> hey, don't you give up on some of those Andersonites. They still hope for some of them. And I said, and you've got it. Now, where's that going to lead him? That's going to lead him straight down the dispensational path, and he'll wind up a Bible believer. He just stays honest with the Scriptures. Now, this begs the next question. If things work differently, then what was different? Now, listen to me. Nobody go Listen, and here's where we need to clean up our terminology. How are the Old Testament saints saved? They weren't. How did they, get old, how did they get salvation in the Old Testament? They didn't. Bill Grady so aptly put it like this. If I were to look at you and say, or if you were to look at me and say, Brother Suter, are you saved? And I'd say, yes, I am. How'd you get it? I worked for it. Would, I, am I, would you say I'm, I have salvation? If I was to say this, I'm saved, but I believe I've got to do good works after or I'll lose it. Would you say I'm saved? Then why in the world are we calling the Old Testament saints saved? We've got to clean up our terminology. And I'm, I'm the first one to raise my hand and say I'm guilty. They weren't saved. They didn't have salvation like me and you. And here's the thing, man. All these fundamentalists will get to uh, Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 18. Go to Ezekiel 18. Now, I've heard plenty of soul-winning messages preached out of Ezekiel 18. If thou warn not the wicked, the blood will be upon your hands. And I've, I've dabbled in that a little bit too, Amen. But boy, they won't touch the verses in Ezekiel 18 I'm about to talk about. Go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, look there at verse number, uh, verse number 19. Yet you say, Ezekiel 18, 19, Yet you say, Why doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful, hath done that which is lawful, hath done that which is lawful, and right, and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them, he shall surely what? Live. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity uh, of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins, that is not New Testament salvation. I didn't turn from all my sins to be saved. And I love you, but if you're here this morning, you say, well, I believe man's got to turn from his sins to be saved. When did you get saved then? Come on now. I think you ought, listen, you ought to admit you're a sinner. I, I think you ought to have a change of mind and attitude about your sin. But folks, it is impossible for you to turn from all your sin. You can't turn from your sin. Well, I quit drinking, I quit drugging, I quit running around when I got saved. And that, but yeah, but now you're a gossip and a hypocrite, okay? Huh? You didn't, come on now, you didn't quit sinning, you just changed the type of sins you commit. You, you, listen, you got saved and realized there's a whole lot of sins you can commit up here now. Turn from all this sin. Look at verse 21. And he that committed, uh, that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. And all his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done them shall he live. Now here's where it gets interesting. Verse 24. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, I'm not saved on my righteousness, I'm saved on Christ's righteousness. But the Bible says... His righteousness, that's personal Old Testament righteousness. 
and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is obviously no. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he hath sinned in them shall he, what? Die. Verse 26, the end of the verse, for iniquity that he hath done shall he, what? Die. Had a man, I won't call any names, but had a man tell me, that's talking about physical life, not spirit. In him shall he die. That's physical. That's not talking about spiritual. Interesting. Cross referencing is the key to learning. Interesting enough, the only other place we find the phrase dying in sin is found in John 8 24, where Jesus said, If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sin. That's just talking about physical. Why would this be physical, but when it's quoted in the New Testament, all of a sudden it's spiritual? That sounds like you're interjecting your own opinion because your opinion doesn't line up with what the book's clearly trying to say. This is spiritual. And we as Bible believers look and say, there was a level of works involved in the Old Testament. Really quick, really, yeah, really quick, go to Psalms 15. Go to Psalms 15. We won't take time to... It's only six, five verses, but we won't read it all. But Psalms 15, you've got an entire Psalms talking about works. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that believeth on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, he that backbiteth not, so forth and so on. The death, burial, and resurrection not mentioned one. Now, here is the truth that we've got to grasp about this then. Nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Nobody goes to heaven without being saved. Nobody goes to, listen, nobody goes to heaven without believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What about the Old Testament saints? They didn't go to heaven, they went to paradise. But yeah, but preacher, he led the captivity captive. They got out of paradise. I'm going to show you two things. I'm going to show you, number one, how they got in paradise, and I'm going to show you, number two, how they got out. Now, here's the thing. Ezekiel 18 says, if he shall, he, if he shall turn from all his sin, and if he shall keep all my commandments. Now, the Bible says that by the law there shall no flesh be what? Justified. Is it, was it possible for any Old Testament saint to ever keep all the law? No. So therefore, he could not keep all his statutes. Therefore, he could not turn from all his sin. Therefore, I've often told my people there's two ways to heaven. Do you know there's two ways to heaven? What are the two ways to heaven? Number one, you can keep the law your entire life and never commit one sin. That's the first way to heaven. Or number two, you can trust Jesus. I've already blown the first one, so I think I'll do the second one. Hello? Now... Therefore, they did not receive grace like me and you receive grace. Therefore, they were not saved like me and you are saved. So how did God operate? Well, let's go back to the very first chapter where God begins to give the law. Exodus chapter 20. Remember what I said a little while ago? You hear, you hear faith and automatically you think grace. I'm going to show you another word. I'm going to show you another word. You'll hear this word and automatically you'll think grace, but they're different words. As Doc used to say, I know they're different because they're what? Spelled different, amen? Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 6. Exodus 20 verse 6. And showing what? Mercy unto thousands of them that love me and what? keep my commandments. I remember learning this in Sunday school, the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting something you do deserve. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. I deserve to go to hell, but I ain't going. That's mercy. And we can stop right there and shout a while, amen? 
But not only that, not only did God show me mercy and keep me out of hell, but then he turned around and gave me a home in heaven. I'm now getting something I don't deserve. Somebody say amen. amen. So in the Old Testament, they did not receive grace, a home in heaven, but God did keep them out of hell and showed them mercy. That's why in the Old Testament, emphasis on mercy. That's why in the New Testament, emphasis on grace. So the next time one of you, these fundamentals come say, you bunch of, you know, whatever they want to call you, think that Old Testament saints went to heaven by being good. No, we don't either. We don't believe that at all. We think they got into paradise. They had a relationship with God to the point where God showed them mercy. And if you think that God shows mercy based upon solely belief, then please explain to me Exodus 20 verse 6. Because Exodus 20 verse 6 clearly says, showing mercy a thousand men that love me and keep my commandments. All right? So now an Old Testament saint goes, uh, goes to paradise. What happens then? Well, we, uh, quick, quick Bible lesson. Everybody here probably knows it. Jesus, when he dies, John, uh, excuse me, Matthew 12, 40, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall also the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? Part of the earth. When, according to Ephesians chapter 4, when Jesus dies, he goes to the lower parts of the earth. They're in paradise. Write this down, Ezekiel chapter 31, the Garden of Eden during the flood of Noah sunk down to the center of the earth. Read it. Somebody on the broadcast said, hey, what do you think about the Garden of Eden being the center of the earth? We read the verses, exactly what it said. I said, well, I guess I believe it now, amen. Go look for it. It's in Ezekiel 31. I can't remember the verse. All right, now watch this. So they're in paradise. There, it's a holding cell. Now, what does Jesus do those three days? Now, you know, Anderson teaches Jesus is dead for three days and three nights. He teaches that Jesus burned in hell. That's what he teaches. He says, well, he's got to pay for the full penalty of your sin. Guys, hell is not penalty for sin. My sins were taken care of at Calvary, whether or not I'm saved or lost. Hell's not punishment for sin. Hell's punishment for rejecting the Savior. If you're lost here this morning, your sin's already been handled. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He teaches Jesus burned in hell for three, three days and three nights. But guys, it's awfully hard to preach when you're burning. What are you talking about, preacher? Jesus is preaching when he's there. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to build a progression here. I'm, I'm, we're we're going to build a progression. First Peter chapter three. First Peter's in my Bible somewhere, I promise. For, there it is. First Peter chapter three, verse number eighteen. First Peter three eighteen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God, bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but being quickened by the spirit so obviously the putting the flesh and then the spirit there's putting death in the flesh and then there's being raised again resurrected by the spirit remember that verse number 19 by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison now this verse is a little problematic because of verse 20 I've always taught and believe that he went and preached to those Old Testament saints. And this may be what the verse is talking about. Look at verse 20. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering God waited in the days of what? Noah. By the way, I tore one of these Anderson nights up one time. I said, how is Noah saved? He said, by grace. I said, well, according to 1 Peter 3.20, he was saved by water. You know what it says? Read verse 20. He's saved by water. Amen. If you ever want to tear somebody up, just tell them Noah was saved by water. Now look here. So when were these spirits disobedient? In the days of Noah. Newsflash, there were more Old Testament saints after Noah. So we see a hinting of what this verse might be talking about. Let's build upon it though. Go to 1 Peter 4, 6. 1 Peter 4, 6. In fact, let's look at verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is 
to judge the what? Quick and the dead. Now, I don't know what y'all call it up north, but if you cut your fingernail too short in the south, you get into what's called the quick. If you've ever hit the quick, you know it, amen. I got one on this side. I was reaching down to get something on the sink, and I, I was mad or I don't know what was going on. And I reached down, and I hit the edge of the sink, and my fingernail went up about between the lip of the, of the sink there, and I felt the quick. And I got quick, amen. The reason why they call that the quick is because it is alive. You can feel it. It's not dead like the rest of the fingernail. Now, look at verse 6. For for this cause, because he's going to judge the quick and the dead, for for this cause was the what? Gospel preached also to them that are what? Dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. What world is that verse talking about? So not only do we find that Jesus went and preached while he was dead, but we find that he's preaching the what? The gospel. Well, preacher, that could just be talking about people who are spiritually dead. So that's the problem with Anderson and Fundamentals. They want to spiritualize everything. But preacher, that verse could be talking about spiritually dead people. Maybe. But let me show you somebody. I think Brother Randy even mentioned this verse. Let's clear it up right now. Go to John chapter number 11. This will be my last place and we'll, we'll round, up the, round up the sermon. John chapter 11. We know the story. Lazarus has died. Jesus waits. Mary and Martha come running. Why weren't you here? You could have saved them. Verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the what? The resurrection and the life. Now watch this. He that believeth in me, though he were what? Dead, yet shall he live. Well, that's all about spiritual preacher. That's spiritual death. Well, then you've got to explain verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never what? Die. Okay, so if a man's spiritually dead, how does he get spiritually alive? Get saved, right? It's not a trick question. Right? We don't know anymore, preacher. We just... <laughs> we don't know what you're going to say next. I'm going to go down and join the Methodists. It's not complicated. Now watch this. They're not near as fun. All right. So you've got spiritually dead people, but now we've got a spiritually alive person. But the Bible says this spiritually alive person has to believe on Christ. If he's spiritually living, he should have already believed on Christ. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? This is a physical life and death. The passage is not consistent if you try to make it spiritual life or death. But then you've got to ask yourself, who are the physically dead people that are believing on Christ? <laughs> hey, every Old Testament saint who died in faith, having kept the commandments, and God had mercy on them, and they were in paradise. Jesus goes, he preaches the gospel. He says, you guys haven't ever heard this, and I know you guys have been blinded by this. Isaiah, I know you wrote Isaiah 53, and you didn't understand it, but let me explain it real quick for you. I'm the one who's... Hey, I'm the one you was writing about. I'm the one that you were talking about. Hey, David, when you read over there in Psalm 16 that you would not suffer your Holy One to see corruption, I'm the Holy One, and I'm not going to see corruption. Hey, boys, in three days I'm getting out of here, and I want you to come with me, and if you'll believe on me, I pray, if you'll believe on me, I'll get you out of here, and we'll go to heaven together. Somebody say amen. And see, all this, all this is completely hidden from the fundamentalists. And the next, listen, we've got to grasp this truth. We can win people over to our side with this truth. If they didn't go to heaven in the Old Testament, there's got to be a reason. Now, let me show you this. Stephen Anderson teaches. Steve, I've got five minutes and I'll be done. Stephen Anderson teaches that men in the Old Testament go straight to heaven. And he now admits that they did not understand the gospel. 
Brother Sluter preaches three gospels. Brother Sluter's preaching another gospel. Well, wait a second, Mr. Anderson. This is the camera. Is that black clean the camera? Okay, wonderful. You're the one teaching that men in the Old Testament go to heaven without the death, burial, and resurrection. And I teach no such thing. Who's preaching the other gospel now? Stephen Anderson teaches a man can go to heaven without the death, burial, and resurrection in the blood of Jesus Christ. I teach no such thing. Let me give you something that hit me in Mexico when I was there last week. I was teaching through some of this in Mexico. In the future, we also understand for Bible believers, tribulation saints, it works differently again. Well, when they die, where do they go in the tribulation? It ain't heaven, where is it? It's under the altar. Like I said, nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Christ. Nobody goes to heaven, and they got the blood of Christ, but we understand it works differently. Nobody goes to heaven by their works. Nobody's in the body of Christ by their works. And the reality is, as Brother Grady hit on last night, Adam and Eve weren't in the body of Christ like John R. Rice taught. From the church to the rapture, that's when men get in by grace through faith. That's when you get in the body of Christ. That's when you're part of the bride. If we can, preachers, listen, if we can grasp this truth and teach this truth well, I promise you the eyes of people will be open. And that's the only way to rightly divide this truth about Old Testament salvation. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church this morning. God, we've enjoyed this meeting, and I am excited about the remainder parts of this meeting. We love and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Brother Gunther, you come.